everyone. Thank you for joining me. My name is Cynthia Veronica and I am the mother of two children. My oldest son is Sebastian and he is four years old and he happens to have achondroplasia which is the most common form of dwarfism. I want to talk to you about this global pandemic that we're currently undergoing. This is something that is affecting everybody's lives and everybody's livelihoods. I personally live in the San Francisco Bay Area where we're under a mandate to shelter in place. And it's been like this for the past week and we're only allowed to go out for essential needs. So no matter where you live, you're probably affected by this in some way or another. But I'm hoping that we'll all get through this uh, at some point sooner than later. I wanted to make this video because coronavirus is a respiratory illness. So for me personally, when I first heard about the coronavirus, fear set in and perhaps it did for you as well because I have a son with achondroplasia. And my first, my first question was, is he more at risk than your average height person or your average height four-year-old? So in about 80% of patients that contract coronavirus, it shows up as a fairly mild infection. However, in others, Symptoms can include fever, coughing, and shortness of breath. Um, this could also lead to pneumonia. It could lead to severe lung damage. It could also lead to acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS. And ultimately, the body can go into septic shock, which is when the blood pressure goes drastically down and um, oxygen cannot very easily um, be distributed to all the different organs. And so your organs are starved for oxygen. Fluid can build up around and within the lungs, and this could ultimately cause death. Um, I, I recall reading that one patient that actually contracted coronavirus and had some of the more severe symptoms described it as um, having the capacity of about just 20% of his lungs. So generally speaking, the um, anatomy of a person with achondroplasia, in particular in the mid face, um, is different from the anatomy of your average height person. So if you go to the lpaonline.org website, you can actually find different publications on achondroplasia as it relates to uh, respiratory illnesses or um, respiratory complications especially in infants. And one thing I read was that one of the reasons why it's more prevalent in infants is because when they're breathing, um, especially at night, um, infants have a hard time in general, not just with achondroplasia, but in general, they have a hard time being able to distinguish how to breathe through their nose versus how to breathe through their mouth. Um, and like I said, this is something that's more prevalent at nighttime during sleep. And so whenever there's so whenever there's a blockage in the nasal pathway, there tends to be a higher rate of death in infants. And so there's another publication about four categories of breathing complications or breathing issues that people with achondroplasia may display. So I wanted to kind of just go over some of these different four different categories with you briefly. The first is problems with bucket handle movement of the chest walls. And essentially what this means is that the chest is generally smaller in people with achondroplasia. So there's an increase in compliance on the part of the rib cage. Basically this can lead to ineffective chest mechanics and what this leads to essentially is um, ineffective lung volumes. So insufficient amount of uh, air going into the lungs. So the second is decreased flow of air going to the nose and throat. And this was actually something that was pretty evident for my son as well, something I noticed. So this happens um, generally in, in people with achondroplasia because of um, uh, insufficient amount of cartilage bone that is formed. It results in flattening of the entire um, nasal bridge and flattening of the, the mid face as well. Um, also someone with achondroplasia may, may have something that's called antiversion and that's basically when the tip of the nose is pointed upwards um, rather than downwards and usually that's something that resolves itself over time. Um, so you see this more in infants or in, in babies um, and um, as uh, the child matures, 
um, the nose will start to form a more downward direction. So the third problem is in the nervous system, and this is something that can affect the respiratory center or muscle function. So basically, this is um, when the cervical spine is compressed, and this is something that leads to, or can lead to, central sleep apnea. Um, and it can be resolved through decompression surgery of the cervical spine, or the, um, basically the neck area, um, where bones in the neck, um, in the, the spine where the neck is, um, can be removed to alleviate and, and allow for room for the spinal cord to more freely move. So you're probably somewhat or very familiar with decompression surgery if you have a child with achondroplasia. Um, this is one of the first things that comes on your radar or the doctor's radar. They basically tell you that, you know, when they're born that one of the things that they should do is go through a sleep study. Um, you work with the pulmonologist to schedule this and to review the results. And um, once you have the results, they can look at it and determine whether central sleep apnea or even obstructive sleep apnea, which I'll talk about in a minute, is present. And if so, then they may recommend decompression surgery depending on the severity of it. So the sleep study will help you um, determine whether breathing is an issue for your child. And if so, um, they'll talk to you about you know, different choices of what you can do about it. So the fourth category, which is um, a little broad, is just individual disorders that weren't mentioned before that, um, you know, could it add to some sort of synergistic effect when it comes to um, inhibiting the capability of your child to breathe easily on his own, his or her own. So an example of this in Dr. Polly's publication was the combination of central sleep apnea and obstructive sleep apnea. So central sleep apnea, which is called caused by uh, compression of the cervical spine um, in combination with obstructive sleep apneas, which is when there's a blockage in that um, air passageway, um, uh, you know, those two things combined could cause uh, um, even more severe breathing complications, respiratory complications. So, you know, for obstructive sleep apnea, one thing that can be done is um, the doctor may recommend removing tonsils and or adenoids um, to allow for more room for, for air to flow through. So when Sebastian was a baby, one thing I noticed right away was breathing was a lot more labored for him. He was very nasally just during the day in general, um, and I could definitely hear him breathing. And actually to this day, you know, just walking around, going about my normal day with him, I, I can hear him breathing more so than um, an average height child his age. But another thing I noticed was that when Sebastian slept at night as a baby, uh, it, breathing was very um, much so an issue. The, the breathing issues when he slept were so much more noticeable. I mean, there were so many nights when I just didn't sleep. Um, one time in particular, I remember he, he got a cold and it was impossible to get sleep. It was a hundred times worse than when my average height daughter was ever sick at night. I mean, he just couldn't breathe. He was blocked up. Um, breathing through his mouth was still difficult at that time and so I just remember being up all night with him. It was so difficult. Another thing I want to mention is that when Sebastian was first born, I did read a lot of blogs and a lot of books on achondroplasia and one of the blogs that I just absolutely loved reading was Leslie Spencer's Dream Big Little Ones blog. Um, she is a mother of a girl with achondroplasia who happens to be about three years older than Sebastian and she just talked about her journey and one of the things that I remember reading about which was intense was her journey with just dealing with the respiratory illnesses that um, her daughter had. I mean she said she went as far as bringing her daughter to bed with her which is something she said she would never do and she would just hold her and look at her all night long she said she would um, not sleep, but she would still rest. And she would just stay up all night just watching her daughter breathe. And whenever there were moments when her daughter stopped breathing, she would just wake her up quickly um, 
because she knew, uh, you know, keeping her daughter was alive was in her, all in her hands. And um, it was an amazing journey what, what this mom went through. Another book that was absolutely intense in terms of the respiratory illnesses and, and actually probably the most intense that I ever read about was Dan Kennedy's book the um, uh, called Little People. And um, I will post a link to his book below in the description bar, which you can actually access for free. I'll also post down below the link um, to Leslie Spencer's blog, Dream Big Little One as well. Um, but basically Dan Kennedy's book was amazing. Like he basically really went through it with his wife. I mean, they basically had a tag team day and night just to keep their daughter alive. They just worked tirelessly and it was just really inspiring to read about and just incredible. I mean, as I was reading it, I just remember thinking, I don't know if I could have done what they did. So going back to coronavirus, just before the shelter in place mandate, I emailed an ear, nose and throat specialist that is actually on the LPA medical advisory board. Um, I let him know that I had some concerns about achondroplasia and coronavirus. And I would like to read to you his response to my email. So he says, I tried to look into this a bit, but there was nothing specific about achondroplasia and the coronavirus that I have been able to find. Sebastian is in the age group that generally has done better. So that's good. Fewer severe illnesses and lower hospitalization rates. Um, it looks like the high risk group is our older folks. Make sure your parents and older relatives and friends are okay. And while in adults, there seems to be very little upper respiratory involvement, it is more frequent in kids, but not always seen. Um, and none of us has any experience with this particular virus, but the worldwide experience is getting into the literature, and I'm sure that your pediatrician and primary doctor will be your best source of information as they come up. The public health community is working very hard to get information out to doctors, as are the local medical societies and hospitals. And with the current social distancing rules in the Bay Area, all non-urgent non medical visits have been restricted. I would reach out to your pediatrician's office to ask what they're doing about urgent care. I would try to stay out of the ERs or urgent care centers unless necessary. Try to limit his and your exposure to sick people and their germs. Hand washing is the first line of defense. If anyone gets sick, follow common sense guidelines. Use Tylenol for fever. Drink lots of fluids. Track the temperature. Write it down so you keep a record. If he or you is feeling short of breath, reach out to the primary care physician for what to do next. And do you have an oximeter? No, I do not have an oximeter. It clips on a finger to measure oxygen in the bloodstream. That is how the doctors would s decide how about supplemental oxygen. Check to see if uh, the clinic has any other advice. If Sebastian needs to be checked beyond the pediatrician, I'd take him there. If he, did, if he did need to go to the hospital, it might as well be one that can take care of whatever special needs he might have. Give Sebastian a high five for me. So um, I also emailed my, um, my son's pediatrician and I wanna to read to you his response um, to my same questions that I asked uh, the auntie as well. Okay, so he basically says, Sebastian is a very high risk person should he contract coronavirus. I would limit interaction with others and really keep him with just family for the next few weeks. It's a very challenging time, but the virus is very contagious and its course is unpredictable. Should he get sick, you should take him to the emergency room. Um, we have limited access to testing at our clinic and will not see any respiratory illnesses. Please stay healthy. So I was watching the news a few days ago and um, there was a local doctor that was being interviewed and one of the things that she said was, um, please avoid going to the ER and urgent care, and this is for your own protection. And she said the, um, the reason you would wanna to go to the ER or to urgent care is if you would have gone otherwise. Um, she also said that the reason for this is because um, if you go and you don't happen to have coronavirus, you may be exposing yourself to the virus more easily than you would have otherwise. Um, so there's a lot of new cases that are being an announced as the days go by. Um, the incubation period is long enough where it's harder to track. And also there's people that are asymptomatic 
and so so they just don't know how widespread this is so the bottom line if you have a child with achondroplasia that develops respiratory illness call your doctor right away monitor his or her condition also just i mean i know you're probably sick of hearing it but wash your hands try to practice social distancing if possible as much as possible I know it's really hard, but try to find positive, creative ways to do things with your family and spend time with your family. You know, here at home, we basically did a lot of arts and crafts with the kids. We went outside, we looked at different insects and spiders underneath rocks. We sang songs and read a lot of books. So what are you guys doing at home? I would love to hear that. So comment down below, let me know. Thank you for watching and please stay healthy.